I wonder, do you want to talk a little bit about sure. your current research? What are you working on now? Well, I'm doing ed, helping edit a series of books on the American Indian Renaissance. Um, the first one was on literature, but this isn't an idea that was original with me, but it wasn't very widespread, and that was the term American Indian Renaissance was coined for the literature and rarely used for anything but that. Mm -hmm. But it occurred to me that Mamadé published um, House Men of Dawn in the 68, and he was writing it throughout the 60s. Well, Shoulder and Cannon were at IAIA. T.C. Cannon. In the, yeah, T.C. Cannon in the 60s. And their great, their best work, well, Cannon died in the early 70s, so. Mm. But even Shoulder's, his work on Indian themes was done in the 60s and 70s. And um, so that just the way the European Renaissance was in painting and sculpture and drama and poetry and economics and mm -hmm. religion it was a widespread uh, Renaissance. Indian, uh, the Indian Native American Renaissance was the same thing. There was literature, which we just pup finished the book. Mm -hmm. We're doing the second one on the visual arts, including film. You're doing something on film with us. Right. But also sculpture, beadwork, mm -hmm. museums, um, all aspects of the visual arts. Then we'll have a third volume on the economic renaissance, a Choctaw miracle, mm -hmm. um, the various religious reviving the ghost dance, mm -hmm. um, the sovereignty movement, the right. red power movement. Right. Um, all of those kicked off in a very short period of time and I think had some influence on each other. And anyway, right. I think it's a unified phenomenon. I think that's, that's exciting work and it's an intriguing way to think about it. I had not thought of self-determination as being a, a facet of the Renaissance, but I think you make a compelling case there. It does well, look like that was a watershed moment. Renaissance was the birth of uh, nationalism. Right. The end of feudalism, the day of national identity. Huh. And American Indian nationalism is a very strong aspect of the Indian Renaissance. Absolutely right. It seems to me too, and I hadn't thought of this before, uh, just now when you mentioned it, the Renaissance, when we say a Renaissance man, we, we mean somebody who is sort of pluralistic, right? Who's skilled in a lot of different things. And it seems like that's just the kind of pluralism that we're starting to see more of mm. in American Indian work. Maybe this oh, speaks to, to the, oh, the poetry Mamadé. prose work you were talking Mamadé about earlier. is a classic example. Mm. Um, he started as poet, Mm -hmm. He's a great novelist and a, a very good artist. Right, right. Uh, you've written about art in the past, too. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the Oklahoma Indian art landscape. Well, um, of course, Indian art in the Oklahoma tradition grows out of the old Plains Indian TP art and when... Um, after 1890, it was ledger art. And um, then, of course, when the Kiowa Five, when Jacobson brought the Kiowa Five to uh, OU in the 20s, mm -hmm. they became not only nationally, but internationally famous. Right. And that sparked a great interest, um, commercial, in... Indian art, people mm -hmm. buying it, centered um, to a somewhat down to Darko, but really Santa Fe was a large right. Indian market. Right. And in the 30s, Dorothy Dunn had a studio and uh, sort of a New Mexico school of Indian art grew up, different from, recognizably different from the Oklahoma school, uh -huh. but similar. Right in many ways. And of course, 
this became popular and popular and commercial. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was a reaction against it by the so-called Indian New Wave artists, Shoulder and Cannon, mm -hmm. who derided uh, the earlier art as Bambi art. You know, cute little deer bounding over the prairie. Yeah, your greeting card gas yeah, station exactly. version of Indian art. Yes. Uh -huh. And um, the art market had been somewhat unsophisticated. There were really good artists like Jerome Tiger, but mm -hmm. the art market, people would collect it by tribe. I need a Comanche painting, uh -huh. you know, regardless of aesthetic value. Right. And, um, well, with the Renaissance and with the new wave, um, there was uh, quite an incorporation of European sensibility and techniques. Mm -hmm. And um, li both shoulder and cannon. Cannon is from Oklahoma and probably the greatest. Scholler was a great innovator and Cannon's a professor, but Cannon, I think, he, but Cannon is a very learned student of mm -hmm. art who had a lot of influences. Um, an Austrian by the name of Hunter Wasser, but also um, Van Gogh a great deal. He has oh, right. a series of um, Indians posing with European art, I, I which remember, way yeah. to the Van Gogh. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a fascinating one. Yeah. Uh, Cannon's, um, for my money, uh, one of the best uh, Indian yes. artists that I know of. Yeah. You he's know. wonderful. What tribe? Cannon is Kiowa. Kiowa. Oh, I didn't realize somehow that, that I'd forgotten if I knew. Um, it, it seems like maybe it took a little while for that for those that new wave of Indian artists to kind of influence what more was coming out of Oklahoma. Uh, it, 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 as a matter of fact, that, you know, when one thing starts, another doesn't end. Yeah. So you can still find in Anadarko some pretty good painters like Robert Redbird, mm -hmm. who paint the way Jerome Tiger and the, right. to the extent the Kiowa Five did. Meanwhile, even in Santa Fe, there are more galleries of that sort of art than there are of the new wave. Right. But museums are more likely to mm -hmm. value shoulder and can. They had right. an exhibit which toured Europe and went uh, Budapest, Istanbul, mm -hmm. you know. Um, they're very accomplished artists. And to show you the difference, although the others were commercial, shoulders painting sell for in the hundreds of thousands. Oh, well, I, I ought not buy, get my heart set on one then. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you can buy in Anadarko, you can buy a painting for fifty dollars. But mm -hmm. you know, when you talk about cannons, or now that shoulder is dead, of course the price goes way up. But right. cannons are extremely valuable, only for a museum. To, Oh, and right. millionaires now. Hmm. They are gorgeous, and, they're, and yep. they're energetic and innovative, I think it's what yes. I find most attractive about them. It seems like, too, we're finally starting to see more movement on that front. I think of Stephen Paul Judd, for instance, who's mm -hmm. a, a new contemporary Kiowa artist, uh, testing a lot of boundaries, pushing a lot of limits, um, and, and almost daring audiences um, on a couple of fronts. First, to kind of accept the content, but also to deny the, the technique. Uh, he's very skilled. Uh, which is, I well, think, very obvious. Well, Indian artists is, of the new wave has always been confrontational, mm -hmm. anti-Bambi. Um, the painting which started the Renaissance in Indian painting is Indian with a coarse beer, which caused a real tumult when it came out mm -hmm. in the 60s. First of all, there was kind of a taboo about associating Indian drinking, and the Indians hated it. On the service, first of all, 
shoulder sword is somewhat grotesque. The it's Indian a little monstrous. Is, yes, the right. Indian has very sharp teeth. He, you know, right. He's a frightening looking person. Right, right. And then he's sitting with a beer in front of him, and shoulder, who is legitimately a Louis Santo Indian, never really claimed it. He used to say, "I'm a quarter." Louis saying, oh, you can't be a, a quarter something, you call yourself. So it was really others. Mm -hmm. But he was at IAIA, mm -hmm. the Institute of American Indian Art. He, uh, right. And a quarter Indian is an Indian. That's, at least for the feds, most of the times. So, for yeah. the for, for, usually, the, uh, for a tribe, that's mm -hmm. efficient quantum. Right.